Okay guys, in this segment we're going to tackle what happens when we start to factor in moles into our um, different variables here. So uh, up until this point, all we've done was manipulate pressure, volume, and temperature with a starting pressure, volume, temperature, and an ending pressure, volume, temperature. But we had to start factoring in, well, what happens if we actually change the amount of gas or how many moles of gas we're actually using in our process? Because that's also one of our variables here. To do that, we need to talk about Avogadro's Law. Okay. Avogadro's law tells us that as you add more particles into a system, the volume has to go up, okay? Assuming you're leaving pressure and temperature constant, okay? Now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this law in relationship to volume, pressure, and temperature. What would have to happen if you added more particles in, okay? So let's take scenario one. We're increasing the number of particles. So imagine you're pumping air into a tire. You're adding pressure to an uh, air container. Um, Whatever you're doing, you're putting more particles in. You are running uh, the gigantic fans of the Metrodome, pushing air into the Metrodome. What is happening to that system? Okay, for the first one, volume. If we increase the number of particles, well, the law itself says volume has to be proportional to that. So you add double the particles, you get double the volume. Now that assumes that pressure is held constant, okay, and that temperature is held constant. So if we don't mess around with pressure and temperature, more particles means more volume. However, let's say we don't want the volume to change. Let's say you're using uh, an air pump and you're pumping air into uh, an air compressor tank, something that's a rigid tank. What would happen then? Well, as you put more particles in, if volume can't go up, okay, what else could change? Well, more particles means more collisions. If we don't change the temperature of those particles and we don't change the volume, Volume and temperature stay the same. More particles, more collisions. More collisions means more pressure. Okay, so the other possibility here is you add particles, you could increase the pressure. Okay, so basically volume and pressure act the same way. Now temperature is a little different. Okay, so if you add more particles into a container now, and we don't want the pressure to go up, and we don't want the volume to go up, okay, so basically we're saying we don't want to change the size of our container, and we don't want more collisions. So what could we do to have no more collisions if we're going to put more stuff in there, okay? So think about that. If we're going to have indoor recess in an elementary school and you don't want kids to run into each other, but yet you're going to put more kids in a smaller space. Let's say you put all the kids in the gymnasium for indoor recess. If you don't want those kids to run into each other very much, you got to get them to slow down. So when you get them to slow down in the regards of temperature, that means we cool it down. So if you add more particles in and you don't want the pressure to go up or you don't want the temperature, or sorry, you don't want the volume to go up, you have to cool it. So the temperature is inverse compared to the other two variables. What we can do is we can go back to our original constant up on the screen here and when pressure and volume and temperature, pressure and volume are inverses of each other. So they're going to be both be proportional to the amount of gas, whereas temperature is the inverse of that, so it is going to be inverse for your gas, meaning that if you want to add more particles in and you don't want to change pressure and volume, you have to cool it down, okay? If you want to put more particles in and you let volume increase, that's fine, okay? Or you want to let more particles in and if volume has to stay the same and temperature stays the same, pressure has to go up. So you have to change something when you add more particles. Either volume goes up, pressure goes up, or temperature has to be cooled. One of those three things has to happen or some combination of all three has to happen. Okay, what Avogadro's law does for us, it takes this relationship and now it adds a new relationship. Where now we say N, which stands for the number of moles. Okay, I don't, we don't use M because M is related to too many other things like mass and um, molality and some other stuff. So we use N for number of moles times R, and R is just going to be a constant. It's just going to be a mathematical number we put in there to make things equal. Well, if you do those relationships together, we see that the pressure times the volume divided by temperature can equal these number of moles times some sort of multiplier or some sort of gas constant, okay? Which that leads us into our ideal gas law. Now, the ideal gas law, if we put it all together, we call it PV equals NRT, okay? All we've done is move T over here in that relationship to get a single line equation, basically. So nothing is being divided here. Uh, you'll hear chemists refer to this as PIVNERT in terms of the ideal gas law. Uh, pressure, volume, N stands for number of moles, R is a gas constant and T is temperature in Kelvins, okay? 
couple of things you have to be aware of. You have to check your labels on this because you have to have the exact right units to do the ideal gas law. You can't use just any pressure, any temperature, any volume. Okay? Pressure must be either recorded in atmospheres or kilopascals. Volume must be done in liters. N has to be your number of moles. Temperature has to be in kelvins. Okay? Now if you look, liters, moles, and kelvins are, are a must. But pressure is allowed to be two different values. And the reason why is because the R, or our gas constant, has two different relationships here. You either can use an R value that has atmospheres in its label, or you can use an R value that has kilopascals in its label. Okay? Either number is fine. Either number works in the equation. Um, just because we have so many different ways of using pressure with atmospheres and kilopascals, they actually have more than one value for R to be used. So if your problem calls for kilopascals, you use 8.314. If your problem calls for atmospheres, you use 0 0.0821. Okay? This is not an equation back here. This is the actual label for the gas constant. It's a gigantic label. So the R value is liters times atmospheres divided by moles times Kelvin. That number, this is its label. Just like the label for temperature can be Kelvins, or the label for speed is meters per second. The label for R is liters times atmospheres divided by moles times Kelvin. It's a gigantic label. Okay? This equation here now is going to allow us at any pressure, at any temperature, at any volume, we now can solve for number of moles. And once we know number of moles, we then can apply that to any stoichiometry problem that we may have. Here's a quick little video that kind of walks you through the idea of what's going on in terms of pressure, temperature, or volume also. The ideal gas law relationship between pressure, temperature, volume, and number of atoms can be demonstrated using a piston. As the volume of the cylinder decreases under constant temperature and number of atoms, the pressure increases due to the increased rate of collisions against the wall of the cylinder. We now lock the piston to create a constant volume and number of atoms. Increasing the temperature results in increased kinetic energy for the atoms. The result is an increase in both temperature and pressure. Removing the heat source allows the kinetic energy of the atoms to dissipate to the surroundings and the system returns to original conditions. With pressure and temperature held constant, additional atoms can be added to the cylinder. This results in an increased volume in the cylinder. If we double the number of atoms, the volume will double under these conditions. Okay, so that relationship is kind of shown in the video there. We're going to move on, and we're actually going to use this equation now in a practice problem. Okay, so here's our practice problem for the ideal gas law. You have 0.25 grams of carbon dioxide in a 355 milliliter container at 35 degrees Celsius. What pressure will the gas exert on the container? Now, when I solve ideal gas law problems, what I always do is I write the Pivnert equation down in a line, and I start labeling out everything I have in the problem, and then I solve it. So I'm going to set it up for you, allow you guys to solve it, and then we'll come back and see the final answer with that. Okay? So let's go to the board. Ideal gas law is PV equals nRT. So we need to have a pressure, a volume, number of moles, R, and T. These are all the possible variables we have in this problem. So if we go into our problem, we say we have a pressure, okay? So we're looking in there, we have grams, we have carbon dioxide, we have milliliters, we have Celsius. We don't have a pressure. Oh, that's going to be our question. So we're actually going to solve for the pressure. That's what we're going to solve for in this problem, okay? Second thing is volume. So we take a look. We have a 355 milliliter container. Okay, now, we've got a good volume. Problem, that's in milliliters. We can't work in milliliters with the ideal gas law. We have to work in liters. So before you put it into Pivnert, you have to convert this to liters. Next thing, N, okay? So now we're going to use number of moles for N. Uh, we have 0.25 grams of carbon dioxide. There's no moles in the problem. Hmm, wait a minute, we have grams and we have carbon dioxide. So if I know I have 0 0.250 grams of CO2, I should be able to convert to moles of CO2. Doing a little dimensional analysis here, a really short one, okay? So we can do that conversion. 
r, r is a constant, so it's either going to be one or two numbers. And because the problem doesn't ask us for a specific pressure in kilopascals or in atmospheres, we can use either value that we want to, okay, to solve this. So you can choose to use the 8.314 if you're going to do liters times kilopascals divided by moles times Kelvin, or you can use 0 0.0821 if the pressure you want to solve for is in liters times atmospheres divided by moles times Kelvin. So if you want your answer to be in kilopascals, you use this number. If you want your answer to be in atmospheres, you would use this number. Now the question doesn't ask for one or the other, so you can choose whichever one you want to use. Okay, just realize you had to label your answer properly according to the right gas law constant. And then finally, temperature. Well, we have 35 degrees Celsius, so that's an easy one. Right? Oh, no, it isn't. We can't use Celsius because we can't have negatives. So, can't use Celsius, so you have to convert this to Kelvins, okay? So, on the surface, the problem is going to be pretty straightforward, but you had to do a lot of work ahead of time to get to the right units. Convert this to liters, convert this to moles, pick one of these two, convert this to Kelvins, and then now you can substitute back in to your ideal gas law constant. Okay, so go ahead and do that on your own, and then we'll reconvene and I'll show you the answer key. Okay, so hopefully you guys got a chance to work it out, and if you did, you would come up with uh, one or two possible answers, and both the math are on the screen there for you. So we had the 0.25 grams of carbon dioxide. Using molar mass, we were able to convert that to moles of carbon dioxide. The 355 milliliters went to 0.355 liters. The Celsius, adding 273, went to 308 kelvins. We're solving for pressure, so I'm going to divide both sides by volume to get the V on the other side. So my pressure would equal NRT over V. Substitute my numbers in. Here's my moles. Here's my gas constant. Here's my kelvins divided by my volume. Notice how the only difference between these two equations here is what my gas constant is. And if I was solving for kilopascals, I should have gotten 41.0 to three significant figures. And if I was solving for atmospheres, 0 0.405 atmospheres in this scenario. Okay? So that is uh, one example of the ideal gas law. Um, we're going to take this up a notch, and we're going to have you guys work out one more ideal gas law problem. This one you can feel free to do in groups. Feel free to do with... Uh, several people in the room and solve and this is how we're going to either end our day or we're going to work through this and then any time you have left over in the day uh, you can work on worksheet number two which is all ideal gas law um, type of problems. So here's our question. How many gallons of CO2 gas as in a vapor gas how many gallons of CO2 does one tank of gas produce? Okay. So you drive your car you use a tank of gas how many gallons of CO2 are you spitting into our atmosphere when you do that? Okay, so here's your information that will help you solve the problem. Again, how many gallons of CO2 are made from one tank of gasoline? Well, one tank of gasoline holds 20 gallons of gasoline. Okay, so you're going to start off with 20 gallons of liquid gasoline in your problem. Density of gasoline, we're going to assume to be 0.8 grams per milliliter. Temperature of carbon dioxide at the tailpipe, okay? So we want to know basically how many gallons of CO2 get expelled at the tailpipe. So we'll say it's about 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, it comes out pretty hot. Um, so we'll do 100 degrees Celsius there. Average pressure, okay, it's going to be above atmospheric pressure because it's a pressurized system, so about 110 kilopascals coming out. You have an excess of oxygen, okay? This is a combustion reaction, and yes, you will have to solve for a combustion reaction to make this work. And we're going to assume a gasoline is octane, okay? So this is similar to number 74 in the book assignment we had a couple weeks ago, one of your guys' favorite book assignments of all time. Um, so kind of go back to that idea that you're going to have to do some stoichiometry and the ideal gas law to make this happen, okay? Okay, hopefully you guys got a chance to solve it. Hopefully you were able to work your way through that. Um, this was not designed to be an easy question, um, but I think you guys can handle it, okay? So we're going to work through the process. Now, before I even show you any parts of the answer key, if you take a look at this problem, the key here is we need to figure out how many moles 
of carbon dioxide do we make? Because once we know the moles, we can then use the ideal gas law, which we just talked about, and we can solve for volume of gas produced. Okay, we can't use 22.4 liters per mole. That's a number that only works at STP, and we're definitely not at STP here. So we had to solve for moles of carbon dioxide and then use the ideal gas law to plug in. So our first step is a little stoichiometry. So we know we have 20 gallons of gasoline. This value here, one gallon is 3.75 liters. This is something you would have had to look up. Okay, It wasn't given in the problem, but it's not impossible to know the relationship between gallons and liters. You may have gone a different way. That's fine. But somehow you had to get from gallons of gasoline into liters. One liter is 1,000 milliliters. One milliliter is 0.8 grams. So that was using your density that was given to you. Uh, octane has a molar mass of 114.26 grams per mole. And if you balance your chemical equation properly, you had two moles of octane for every 16 moles of carbon dioxide, or 8 to 1, in there. So you end up with 4,000 moles of carbon dioxide. So we're starting to deal with a really, really, really big number here. Okay, So we should expect a gigantic answer in terms of our number as we work our way through. Now, we go back to Pivnert, our ideal gas law. We're solving for volume, so we arrange it to solve for volume. So NRT over P, plug our numbers in. We have 4,240.514 moles. We're going to be working in kilopascals, so I have 8.314 is my kilopascals, because our label up here is kilopascals. I have 373 kelvins, because we had to convert this to kelvins, and we had 110 kilopascals of pressure. Plug all that in and solve, and we get this gigantic number in liters of carbon dioxide. Okay, so we're now we're still in liters. The question did ask for gallons, so let's convert that over. Take this 119,538.5 liters of carbon dioxide, convert from liters back to gallons, and there is your gigantic correct answer. And yes, that is a realistic answer. Every time you burn a gallon of gasoline in your car, you're putting 31,000 gallons of carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. Keep in mind, the ideal gas law, we have five things in here. You always need to know four of the five to solve for your problem. The one piece that was missing, we didn't know moles. You knew the pressure, you knew R, you knew the temperature. We solved for volume, so the stoichiometry gives us moles to solve that. All right, guys, that's the end of the video. Uh, any time you have left in class, uh, please use working on worksheet number two. Thank you.